Tonight, getting hostages out of Gaza. Hamas releases two more hostages days after freeing two Americans. We'll speak to the Red Cross about their condition and explore what this means for a potential Israeli ground invasion. Plus, uh, yeah, we want law enforcement as soon as we get on the ground and park. The heart stopping moment on board a flight operated by Alaska Airlines, an off duty pilot in the jump seat now charged with 83 counts of attempted murder, accused of trying to shut off the engines during a domestic flight and what the crew on board had to do to stop him. And it's the best idea because I don't want to be shot by the, by the Israeli soldiers now. For the millions of Palestinians that call Israel home, this conflict didn't begin just two weeks ago. We take you to Jerusalem and meet some of the Arab Israelis looking on in horror at the bombardments by Israel, while also fearing what Hamas's attack and the Israeli response will mean for them. And good evening, everyone. I'm Trevor Alden for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with the latest developments in the conflict in the Middle East, with Hamas now releasing two more hostages today, this time two elderly Israeli women who had been abducted from their homes during the terror attack that took place now more than two weeks ago. But the husbands of those women, who are also both in their 80s, remain hostages in Gaza. The latest release comes as the IDF has escalated its strikes on Gaza in the past 24 hours, but Israel is now facing calls to delay a full-scale ground invasion to allow time for negotiations to try to get more hostages released. And there are also calls to get more humanitarian aid into Gaza to ease the crisis there. A handful of trucks coming in from Egypt today, but hundreds more are waiting to get through. We have team coverage tonight. We begin with ABC's Matt Gutman in Israel. This is the moment tonight in which two elderly Israeli hostages, Nurit Cooper, age 79, and Yochevet Lifshitz, 85, arrive at the border between Gaza and Egypt, finally free after more than two weeks in the hands of Hamas. Lifshitz, seen here, eased out of a Red Cross van, reaching back for that embrace and kiss of a Red Cross official. Both taken away in ambulances, receiving care at the Rafah border crossing with Egypt before arriving back in Israel. Hamas releasing this video showing armed militants turning the hostages over to the Red Cross, which facilitated their release. Qatar and Egypt also helping broker the deal. Yochevet and Nurit abducted from their homes along with their husbands during that merciless surprise attack on October 7th when Hamas terrorists stormed dozens of communities near the Gaza Strip, including their kibbutz near Oz. Over 1,400 Israelis were killed that day alone. A quarter of Nir Oz's population taken hostage. Cooper and Lifshitz's husbands, both in their 80s, still believed to be captives of Hamas. Late today, Lifshitz's grandson, Daniel, speaking to the Israeli press. The Broita. Saying they've communicated with my grandmother and that he hopes this opens the door for more hostages to be released. Daniel saying both his grandparents' phones last pinged from inside the Gaza Strip a week ago and they didn't know if they'd survived. Earlier today, Daniel saying his grandmother had dedicated her life to improving the plight of Palestinians in Gaza. They are uh, human rights activists, peace activists for all their life. For more than a decade, they took sick Palestinians from Gaza Strip to the hospitals in Israel to get treatment for their disease, for cancer, for anything. They couldn't get the right treatment in Gaza. The release of those hostages coming as Israel launched one of its deadliest barrages on Gaza yet, striking hundreds of targets and promising a multilateral operation in the air, ground and sea. Gaza officials saying over 400 Palestinians killed in the past 24 hours. <laughs> Palestinian journalist Moataz Azaza rescuing these two wounded toddlers, rushing them to a hospital. People gave me these two babies. They are injured by the bombing. I just see them. You're fine. And today, more than 20 trucks carrying aid arriving into Gaza from Egypt, food and medicine, but no fuel. Israel fearing it could be used by Hamas. The aid meeting only about 1% of Gaza's daily needs. Allah. Tonight, more than 220 families still waiting for word on their loved ones held hostage, including Ohad Zakri. His family solemnly marking his ninth birthday today without him. Many holding balloons and signs calling for his release. Today, we spoke to the family of the first two hostages released by Hamas, Judith and Natalie Ranan, freed over the weekend. 
Ayelet Sela says the terrorists who kidnapped her cousins spoke English. Eight members of Ayelet's family still being held by Hamas, a family tree entirely broken, making that reunion even more intense. What was it like seeing them for the first time? All the emotions, all at once. I can say that I never felt uh, a hug this intense in my life. I'm sure that's true. It's just unbelievable what these families are going through. And Matt Gutman joins me now from Israel. Matt, of course, such relief for those families today. But of course, there are so many more people still being held in Gaza. Are these hostage releases putting any more pressure on Israel to delay this ground invasion so that maybe more hostages can be freed alive? Trevor, it's images like this that we saw coming in late today. Those two senior Israeli hostages freed by Hamas, fragile, pale, but unharmed. And it's giving hope and expectations to additional family members that they could also see their loved ones released. And these images have been plastered wall to wall in Israel, putting increasing pressure on Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu, being echoed in Washington, by the way, to pause that invasion of the Gaza Strip and instead work on freeing those 200 and 20 hostages. Trevor. Just unfathomable what they've gone through. Matt Gutman, thank you. Meanwhile, the Biden administration remains in close contact with Israel as this crisis unfolds. So let's bring in ABC's chief White House correspondent, Mary Bruce. Mary, is President Biden putting any pressure on Israel to get more hostages out of Gaza before any possible ground invasion starts? Well, Trevor, the president has made clear that getting these hostages out is his top priority. Of course, today we saw those two Israelis released getting into that ambulance. This after that American mother and daughter were freed on Friday. And the president is still working to try and get more humanitarian aid into Gaza. We saw those additional trucks rolling in today. And while publicly the White House insists they are not going to dictate Israel's military response behind closed doors, we have learned that they are urging caution, pressing Israel to delay its ground invasion hoping to buy time to get more hostages out and more aid in. All of this comes as the administration is trying to contain this from becoming a wider war. We know they are keeping a close eye on Iran. Today saying that Iran is, quote, actively facilitating attacks to try and escalate this conflict, Trevor. That wider war, wider war is something so many people have said they're afraid of. Mary Bruce Force at the White House. Mary, thank you. Thank you. And of course, we continue to think of all the families impacted all around the world. And joining us now is Guy Itzhaki, whose niece, Eden, is being held hostage by Hamas. Guy, thank you so much for being here. Your niece, uh, Eden, was at that Nova Music Festival. I know she was on the phone with her sister for four hours as she was trying to hide from Hamas terrorists. Uh, just first off, uh, b b before anything, our condolences to what your family is going through right now. I would l like to get your reaction to more, two more hostages being released today. Yes, yeah, so we are really happy about that. This is uh, one more step towards uh, getting Eden back home. And we are happy on everyone that will be released uh, from the Hamas. Did the Israeli government give you any information about any plans to try to rescue her? Sadly, no. Uh, we didn't get that. Uh, but we trust the government that they know that they cannot neglect right uh, more than 200 civilians and soldiers that uh, are uh, held by Hamas and they will probably do or will do everything they can to release them uh, back home. We do know that Israel is reportedly preparing this multilateral operation that is targeting the Gaza Strip where Eden is. is. Uh, do you want them to hold off on that until they make more efforts to try to rescue her and the other hostages? So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I know there is a conflict, you know. On one hand, the government would like to bring everyone back home safe soon. And on the, and on the other hand, they would like to invade uh, Gaza in order to fight the Hamas. And these are two contradicting, might look contradicting, uh, uh, I would say, approaches. And um, I think... First, the first priority should be releasing the hostages. And I can share that yesterday we met with the president. We were, uh, my sister and myself, and few more families. And the president said that this is the first priority, to release the, the all, uh, everyone that uh, uh, currently in Gaza. So I hope, you know, there is a balance, and I hope the government and the army knows what they are doing. 
You talked about this a little bit in that you said that you know Eden was unharmed when she was taken. We've heard that she was on the phone for several hours with her sister. What else can you tell us about the conversation that they had over the course of those hours? Yeah, so when uh, everything started, it was uh, Saturday early morning. Eden called her mother crying, told her that uh, terrorists were attacking them. Uh, she was on the phone with her mother and sisters for hours, and during that time, um, they hear they hear sh uh, shotguns, uh, people crying and dying. So Eden uh, ran, uh, ran, and uh, she took cover uh, in a car with two dead bodies. Uh, at some point, her phone battery died, so she took another phone and continued the call with her mother from that uh, phone. Um, suddenly, the, after an hour and a half, uh, someone opened the door of the car. She thought this is someone who came to rescue her, but it was another guy from the party running for his life. She thought this is a great opportunity uh, to escape. She joined him, but... Uh, uh, shortly after, they split apart, and she hid uh, under a bush uh, for a few more hours. And um, then she whispered, they are taking me. We heard some voices in Arabic, something like Ta'al Hun, which means uh, basically get up or something like that. And uh, the call was disconnected. Guy, if you could speak directly to where she was being held, what would you tell your niece and what would you tell her captors? Yes, yeah, so to, to Eden, I would like to tell, be strong, we are strong, we are here for you. All your friends are here, they think about you 24 seven, we love you very much and you will come back home soon. Well, Guy, we certainly appreciate you time, your time. We're wishing Eden the best and the best to your family as well. Thanks so much for speaking with us. Thank you. And we want to talk more about aid efforts as well. So let's welcome in Jason Strazuso, who's a spokesman for the International Committee of the Red Cross. Jason, thank you for being here. So the big headline today, Hamas releasing two more hostages. Those hostages are now with the Red Cross. So explain uh, the role that your organization is playing in all of this. From day one, we activated our relationship with Hamas. We approached them and we basically insisted on three things, that all the hostages be released as soon as possible. But if that weren't going to happen, that we be allowed to visit them and check on their health, make sure their welfare is okay. And then third, that they be allowed to uh, change, exchange messages or even speak uh, with their family members. So now, as of last Friday, you saw, and the whole world saw that Hamas released the two American women. Our role in that was to meet uh, the people that were holding them and, meet, and take the two women, put them in a Red Cross land cruiser, and then drive them across Gaza into Israeli hands and make sure they were safe and then go back. Um, it sounds simple, uh, but of course it's quite complicated and, and complex and, and, and quite dangerous. You need the trust of the, the parties on both sides that they believe that you're gonna show up, that you're really the Red Cross and that you're gonna really do what you say you do. And Hamas seems to be open to this kind of back and forth and also checking in on not only these hostages released, but the ones that are still being held? So what I, what I would say about that is that we do have a working relationship with Hamas, specifically on humanitarian issues. So you asked about, do we have access to, to these hostages? And the answer that, to that is no. We most certainly wish we did. We're speaking with Hamas, asking for this access. We'll continue to do that. We'll continue to work on it. And I know that you've said this is a very delicate balance here. I'm sure discretion is certainly part of it. If you could, because I know these newly released hostages is still kind of unfolding right now. Can you walk us through how the release of the hostages on Friday came to be? Well, there would have been extremely close contact between us and then the parties on the two sides here, um, and only a very small handful of people inside the Red Cross would know that that contact is taking place, that these plans were taking place, because um, trust is, is so crucial to this, and something can go wrong at any moment. Um, if I'm a Red Cross worker in G Gaza, I put on my Red Cross vest, 
a symbol of neutrality. I get in the car, I go to the agreed upon point, and uh, we take or we greet the, 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 the hostages, in this case the women, and um, put them in the car and then drive them across town. And that's really all our role is confined to because we hand them off to the authorities who will do the medical checks and 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 will reunite with the families. But of course, we're it's an important role and, and we're we're happy to do it. Speaking more broadly, there's of course concern about aid in Gaza. So what are the critical needs there right at this moment? Uh, the, at the top of our list is safe drinking water. We knew as soon as as soon as this crisis happened that we were there was going to come a point when uh, there was a, a, a real dearth, a real lack of safe drinking water in Gaza, and I think we're starting to see those effects now. I will say that uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross, we do have 60 tons of aid. Uh, ready to move into Gaza, and among that is chlorine tablets to increase uh, the safety of the water, and we're eager to get that in. And then the second thing that I mentioned was uh, we think it's absolutely critical that hospitals can run at full capacity, that all the machines that keep patients alive, whether it's an incubator or a dialysis machine, is able to work. And I know that you work in conflict zones, but how would an Israeli ground invasion complicate those efforts to get that aid? Well, uh, we we would only move in a in a place that that was safe. Um, a, we're not going to put our staff in danger, but B, we're not going to try to deliver assistance in a location that is being affected directly by the fighting, and then that has that has the effect of attracting people to a location for you know a food assistance or, or medical assistance or whatever the case is. We wouldn't want to attract people to a location that's not safe. So um, if uh, a ground invasion happens, then it will reduce the area that we can safely operate in. Uh, that's point number one. Point number two is that one of our concerns, not just here in Gaza, but globally, is um, the increase in urban conflict. We know that uh, urban fighting uh, brings quite often higher cases of civilian casualty and long-term damage. And we work with, with all parties and the parties in this case as well to try to minimize that civilian harm as much as possible. Jason Strazuso from the International Committee of the Red Cross, thank you so much. Thank you. And we will come back to the major developments in the Israel-Hamas war later in the program. But for now, we want to turn to the other major news today and the terrifying moments on board a passenger jet when an off-duty pilot allegedly tried to shut down the engines. Mid-flight with 83 people on board, authorities say the on-duty cockpit and the cabin crew had to subdue this man and handcuff him to a seat. ABC's transportation correspondent Gio Benitez has the details. Tonight, the FBI is investigating after an off-duty pilot allegedly tried to crash a passenger plane. Alaska Airlines Flight 2059 left Everett, Washington, bound for San Francisco at 5.23 p.m. Sunday, packed full with 80 passengers, including multiple infants on laps. And 44-year-old Joseph Emerson, an off-duty pilot with Alaska Airlines, who was hitching a ride, seated in a jump seat inside the cockpit. Soon after takeoff, he allegedly tried to cut the plane's engines by pulling the fire extinguisher handles on the engines called a T-handle. The T-handle, which is what this individual tried to pull on each engine, actually turns the engine off and prepares it for a fire extinguisher. The problem is, at high altitude, you can get the engines restarted. At low altitude, there could be a fatal result. The crew able to overpower Emerson and get him out of that cockpit handcuffing him to a seat in the rear of the cabin. We've got the uh, guy that tried to shut the engines down uh, out of the cockpit. Doesn't sound like he's causing any issue in the back right now. I, I think he's the dude. I was panicked. I was alone in the back, um, and, you know, everyone was shifting around um, trying to figure out what was happening. The pilots diverting to Portland, where Emerson was taken into custody. After we did land and the gentleman was escorted off, the flight attendant got back on the speaker and said, plain and simple, he had a mental breakdown. Tonight, the airline and the FAA say the incident is not related to current events. And Gio Benitez joins us now. Okay, Gio, so we hear in your reporting not related to current events, but is there any idea of what the motive could have been? 
Well, Trevor, as you can imagine, right now the FBI, all of the investigators, they are scouring his social media because they want to know everything about his past to see what that motive could have been. Uh, meanwhile, he will be in court tomorrow, and again, he's facing 83 counts of attempted murder. It's an incredible amount of charges that he's facing now. Trevor. Staggering and so frightening. Gio Benitez, thank you. We want to head to Washington now in the chaos on Capitol Hill with the race for a new House Speaker back at square one after Congressman Jim Jordan failed to gain enough support in three votes on the House floor last week. So now there are nine declared candidates vying for the job, but can any of them get enough support to win the Speaker's gavel? ABC's Rachel Scott has the latest from Capitol Hill. Tonight, nine new Republican candidates for Speaker of the House seven of whom voted to overturn the 2020 election in the hours after the attack on the U.S. Capitol. 20 days after Kevin McCarthy was ousted, the party still unable to unite behind one candidate. Is there a sense of urgency here for the conference to come together? Yes, there is, and there needs to be, and I do think at this point it's uh, right smack in front of everyone. First, they nominated Steve Scalise. He backed down before a vote even went to the floor. Then Jim Jordan failed on three straight ballots. A speaker has not been elected. Now with the government shutdown looming, the nine Republicans in the race, relatively unknown beyond their districts, are vying for a job that would put them second in line to the presidency. We asked some of those seven, do they stand by their decision to not certify the election after the attack on the Capitol? Do you stand by that vote? I do. Tonight, the leading candidate so far, Tom Emmer, one of only two who voted to certify the election. And that's a problem for Donald Trump and his allies. I spoke to Mr. Emmer. I spoke to a lot of congressmen that called me up, and they all called asking for support. And, of course, I have to hold it for a while. All right, so let's bring in Rachel Scott from Capitol Hill now. All right, Rachel, we got nine candidates now in the race. So what happens next in the process, and can Republicans come together behind whoever the new nominee is? Well, that is the big question, Trevor. Right now, Republicans are meeting behind closed doors. They will hear from all nine candidates with the hopes of selecting a new nominee by tomorrow. We are learning that every single candidate has signed a pledge to support the eventual nominee, no matter who that is. And tonight, the front runner is believed to be Congressman Tom Emmer. He's the number three Republican in the House. But sources tell me that Donald Trump has privately told his allies that he does not support Emmer. And now he is facing a pretty serious pressure campaign because he voted to certify the 2020 election election, Trevor. All right, Rachel Scott for us. Rachel, thank you. And also tonight, there is an urgent manhunt after a Maryland judge was shot multiple times in his own driveway, dying at the hospital. Police have announced a new clue, though, the discovery of the suspect's vehicle. Here's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas. Tonight, five days after authorities say a Maryland judge was shot in a targeted attack in his own driveway, the urgent manhunt for Pedro Argote underway. Their primary clue, his 2009 Mercedes SUV like this one, found over the weekend eight miles from the scene of the murder. According to authorities, Judge Andrew Wilkinson was shot multiple times outside of his home while his wife and children were inside. We think uh, Judge Wilkinson was targeted. Uh, he ruled in a court case early in the day against Mr. Agate, and we feel that was the, that was the reason for the murder. Just hours before he was killed, Wilkinson granting Argote's divorce, ruling that he could have no contact with his wife or his children unless initiated by her. And tonight, new details about Argote's marriage. The couple apparently got into heated arguments, and at one point his wife sought and later dropped a restraining order. The Washington County Sheriff's Office did respond to the home a couple times for uh, verbal domestics in the last uh, few years, but no uh, physical violence that we know of. And Pierre Thomas joins us now. So, Pierre, have police released any details on where the suspect may be? Well, they believe he may have left the immediate area, but they are urging the public to stay on alert, Trevor, because he's considered armed and dangerous. Absolutely. Pierre Thomas, thank you. Well, Detroit police are providing an update surrounding their ongoing investigation of a synagogue president who was fatally stabbed at her home. 40-year-old Samantha Wool was found at her home after police were alerted of an unresponsive person on the ground and then following a trail of blood. Police work closely with the FBI to analyze forensic evidence and conduct interviews, but so far say they have found no evidence of anti-Semitism as a motive. 
Well, thick fog and zero visibility caused a deadly and massive pileup on I-55 in Louisiana just outside New Orleans. It involved dozens of cars and trucks. Vehicles slammed into each other with at least one person going over the guardrail. Some of those vehicles even catching fire. Our Victor Okendo has the latest on the dead, the injured, and those left stranded. Tonight, a deadly mix of fog and smoke from nearby marsh fires, blinding drivers, and triggering multiple pileups west of New Orleans. Dozens of burned out cars and trucks choking I-55, leaving more than 100 drivers stranded on the highway. Several of those crashes today, sparking fires on the highway, flames and smoke seen in the distance. Well, I'm trying to tell you, whoa, somebody, hey boy, check on your people. Firefighters using ladders to reach some of the fiery wreckage. The phenomenon known as super fog, a mix of fog and smoke, is especially dangerous on highways where visibility can suddenly drop to just a few feet within minutes. This was the view from behind the wheel this morning as a thick shroud of fog moved in, blanketing New Orleans. The skyline completely disappeared. And tonight, Louisiana's governor is urging residents to donate blood to help the wounded there's a chance of more super fog in the coming days. Trevor? Wow, unbelievable video. Victor Okendo, thank you. Meanwhile, tonight, a major turn in the strike against the big three auto workers as another plant has shut down. Nearly 7,000 workers walked out of the Stellantis plant in Sterling, Michigan, where its best-selling Ram trucks are made. The strike's now idled 40,000 union members. It's caused an estimated $9.3 billion in losses, and those are losses for workers, companies, suppliers, dealers, and customers, too. CVS is removing one type of common decongestant from their shelves after an FDA advisory committee said it was ineffective. The products contain the oral formulation of phenylephrine, or PE, which is found in several over-the-counter medications. After nearly a century of over-the-counter use, though, the FDA's Non-Description Drugs Advisory Committee unanimously voted in September that PE did not improve nasal congestion any more than a placebo at the dosage given. CVS did not give specifics on which brands will be removed. And we still have much more to get to here on Prime. In urgent investigation after two police officers were shot, how the suspect is connected to the department's police chief. But next in our Prime Focus, Palestinians living in Israel had long navigated challenges. As the conflict with Hamas escalates, tell us what they say has changed and what's still the same. Jerusalem, our world since 1948. So the generations are getting used to it because they never had peace. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. 
For the Palestinians who live in Israel, this conflict did not begin just two weeks ago. For, for Arab Israelis who have long navigated the challenges of living in Israel, they look at the current situation with horror paired with disappointment. And in tonight's prime focus, our Inez de la Quatera takes us to the old city in Jerusalem. Jerusalem's old city, now a ghost town. The holy city has rarely been this quiet. Only a handful of worshippers at the Wailing Wall. At the Al-Aqsa Mosque II, the third holiest site in Islam. And the Church of the Holy Sepulchre deserted. As Israel wages war on Hamas, tensions in this divided city reaching a boiling point. Like a balloon, put a lot of air inside, and the end it will. Tourists have fled, and nearly all shops in this normally bustling city have closed. The Palestinian population staying home. <laughs> Adnan Jafar, though, decided to keep his sweets shop open. <laughs> He's Palestinian. His shop has been around for 70 years. My grandfather was here, father, me, and my son. So four generations now. The most popular dessert is the knafi. Cheese, the flour on top, pistachios. This makes it sweet. We used to have more things. But now, because of the situation, no business. Our work is for everybody. The Jewish, Muslims, Christians. Pilgrims, tourists, they all come to the old city. Jerusalem are in wars since 1948. So the generations are getting used to it because they never had peace. But in the last week, Adnan has been taking new precautions when it comes to the safety of his adult son. I used to accompany him everywhere. Because of the war, you now walk with your son? Yeah, yeah. In this time, I don't let him go anywhere alone. It's the best idea, because I don't want to be shot by the, by the Israeli soldiers. A city thousands of years old, the United States recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital in 2017, to the horror or jubilation of residents, depending on where you live. Because according to the UN, East Jerusalem is Palestinian-occupied territory. And when you drive through it, you can see what makes this the most policed city in the country. There's been more and more security popping up on the streets of Jerusalem, and you can see it right here. Police have stopped this group of Palestinians. They're now searching their car. This is the reality on the streets of Jerusalem now. Hello. Hello. Hi. We are Mer American News. Press. ABC News. This is police activity. Mm -hmm. okay. You can't picture me. You okay. understand? Oh, you want? I take you to the police mm -hmm. office. Yes, you yes. understand me? We'll we'll move on. We'll move on. Tensions are also fraught in the nearby West Bank, where security forces have been conducting raids, arresting some 63 Hamas operatives, according to the IDF. But civilians say they're also being harassed. <laughs> Adnan Syed is a 23-year-old Palestinian and East Jerusalem native who works in the West Bank. Adnan says he was harassed three times in the last week. Divisions have spiraled in recent months. Back in January, seven were killed outside this East Jerusalem synagogue. At 
the time, the deadliest Palestinian attack in nearly a decade. But while there, ABC's James Longman also met this man, Retief Hassan, in front of what was left of his home. Hassan recorded as Israeli bulldozers left him and 11 family members homeless. He's had his house demolished. He's been fined for having it in the first place, and he has to pay the costs for having it destroyed. And now he's living like this. The government told him his home was built with the wrong permit. And Palestinian homes were being taken down at a brisk pace to clear the way for new settlements. Dozens of Palestinians have been killed in East Jerusalem and the West Bank since the war broke out. More than the highest ever monthly total since the UN began keeping records in 2005. Israel's war with Hamas has sparked renewed anger. Now, if you ask anyone, uh, do you believe in two-state solution, you, they will say no. The anger now on both sides is much worse. For Adnan Jafar, the shopkeeper, he's keeping his door open, looking forward to one day once again welcoming customers of all faiths. How do you see this ending? Everybody is human being. They have the right to live in peace. Everybody. That's Inez de la Quatera reporting, and we still have much more to get to. Coming up, the lawsuit against Panera Bread after the death of a 21-year-old by her family claims a special lemonade drink led her to go into cardiac arrest twice. But next, as tensions escalate in the Middle East, we take a look at the growing presence of U.S. military forces in the region by the numbers. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Suicide turned into a homicide. Jordan came home and I said goodnight to him and that's the last time I saw him. They threatened to send these photos to my family. We want money. You need to get it now. And it was constant. It could happen to anybody. And then he said, Jordan's gone. And I said, no, no, no. It's nothing that no parents should have to go through. Sextortion. Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 
It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. We're concerned about potential escalation. Um, in fact, uh, what we're seeing is a is the prospect of a significant escalation of attacks uh, on our troops and uh, our our people throughout the region. And because of that, we're going to do what's necessary to make sure that our troops are uh, are in the right, uh, good position. Uh, they're they're protected, and that we have the ability to respond. So that was Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin on ABC's This Week on Sunday, addressing the buildup of U.S. military forces as concerns about the escalation of conflict in the Middle East continue to grow. So let's take a look at the U.S. presence in the region by the numbers. The U.S. mobilized forces in the past two weeks as a show of force in support of Israel. That includes two U.S. aircraft carrier strike groups being deployed to the region after the Pentagon redirected the USS Eisenhower strike group across the Atlantic to the Mideast. That's going to join the USS Ford carrier group and its 7,500 personnel on board who are now stationed in the eastern Mediterranean. With some 135 U.S. aircraft on board those two carriers, they are meant to serve as a deterrent against Iran or Hezbollah joining the conflict on Israel's northern border. But a show of force can, of course, quickly turn into a use of force, as we saw last Thursday when the USS Kearney shot down three missiles as well as about eight drones that were fired from Yemen by Houthi rebels. The USS Kearney had been part of the strike group in the Mediterranean, but moved to its new position in the Red Sea. So now more than 2,000 U.S. troops were also ordered to prepare to deploy to other areas of the Middle East on 24 hours notice if needed, with some of those forces deployed over the weekend. And the Biden administration has said no U.S. troops will be involved in combat. There were already 30,000 U.S. troops in the Middle East on regular deployments before these latest moves. That includes 2,200 Marines aboard three Navy ships in the region region who could be available on short notice to assist with potential emergency evacuations in the region. And we have much more ahead here on Prime. Many parents use it to help children sleep, but it could present a health risk. The new warning about sound machines and he sold millions of records while also largely staying under the mainstream radar. We're going to talk to Lil Tecca about his career, and his new album. It all began so beautifully. Suddenly, there was a shot. Mrs. Kennedy's leg was stained with her husband's blood. I want them to see what they have done to Jack. Common data was saying, Lyndon Johnson, now president of the United States. That was when the enormity struck me. I was walking on to a stage for a part I had never rehearsed. I ought to record this. Dr. King's been shot. Senator Kennedy had been shot. But Vietnam dominated the news. What is our country coming to? Are we a sick society? I felt extreme hostility in front of Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy. Was it because I was alive? The greatest courage is to go about the day's work. That's a large order for a woman. <laughs> First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live.
with the crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. The search for a police chief's son accused of shooting two officers, a family suing Panera Bread alleging a drink led to the death of a 21-year-old woman, and why Dwayne The Rock Johnson is weighing in on a debate over his likeness. These stories and more in tonight's Rundown. The Nashville police chief's estranged son has fled after witnesses say he shot two officers. Police reporting that 38-year-old John Drake Jr. opened fire on a pair of officers who were investigating a stolen car. They then say Drake fled. Paramedics rushed those injured officers to a hospital. Doctors say they suffered non-life-threatening injuries. Drake Jr. is wanted for two counts of attempted first-degree murder. Police asking the public to call 911 if they see someone matching his description. The family of a 21-year-old who died after drinking a Panera caffeinated lemonade is suing the company. The family's lawyer saying the woman had a heart condition and suffered two cardiac arrests after drinking the popular lemonade. Their lawsuit claims the drink is not advertised as an energy drink, but contains the same caffeine as about two energy drinks. Panera says it's investigating the incident. A window washer cleaning a building in Boston's financial district died after falling several hundred feet. Police arrived after witnesses reported someone falling several stories from the downtown skyscraper. That building is Boston's second tallest at 32 stories. They have notified OSHA. Police investigating what caused that fall. Chevron says it is buying rival oil company Hess for $53 billion. The deal includes a major oil field in Guyana, which is poised to become the world's fourth largest offshore oil producer. John Hess, the current CEO, is expected to join Chevron's board. Chevron brought in a record $36.5 billion in profit last year. A new warning for parents. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, the excessive and continuous use of sound machines meant to help young children get sleep presents a greater risk for hearing loss or damage because the volume levels often exceed the recommended level for kids. The same Academy of Pediatrics recommends, for example, that nurseries have a volume maximum of around 50 decibels. That's a volume that you and I can speak at without raising our voice. Most of these machines go above that. So if you're going to use them, turn that volume down, place it away from the bed at least seven feet and make sure that you give limits. Dwayne The Rock Johnson says his museum wax figure needs a makeover. A video of the statue in a Paris museum went viral over the weekend. The actor, who is black and Samoan, posted about it on Instagram telling fans the museum needs to adjust his skin color along with a few other important details. 
Johnson said he plans to have his team reach out to the museum to request the updates. The Rock also joked that the next time he's in Paris, he plans to stop by the museum and have a drink with himself. Next tonight, a former Major League Baseball pitcher and another woman are under arrest, charged in connection to the 2021 murder of that player's father-in-law and the attempted murder of his mother-in-law. These arrests came after a two-year investigation into the shootings. ABC's Janae Norman has more. The former Major League Baseball pitcher waking up behind bars, Danny Serafini, charged with the death of his father-in-law two years after the case went cold. 49-year-old Serafini and 33-year-old Samantha Scott were arrested Friday in connection to the 2021 murder of Robert Gary Spore. The 70-year-old's body was found inside his North Lake Tahoe home with a gunshot wound. It's a huge loss. Uh, my brother was real close, the two of us, best friends. Investigators also linking Sarah Feeney and Scott to the attempted murder of the victim's wife, 68-year-old Wendy Woodspore, who was left in critical condition after being shot in the head multiple times. In and out of rehab, she died a year later. The former baseball player is still married to Aaron Spore, one of the victim's daughters. Scott, the other suspect, one of her close friends. In a statement, Aaron writing, I loved my parents very much and miss them. I wish they were here to watch my kids grow up. Police releasing surveillance video showing a hooded man they believe may have been Serafini outside the home hours before the shooting. How about Dan Serafini? Serafini was a first round pick in the 19th. 92 MLB draft, spending more than a decade pitching for six different teams in the major leagues. It's pretty much a kid's dream. But his transition to life after baseball proved challenging. I'm just thinking what a disappointment I am to everybody. In June 2015, he appeared on a show that revealed he lost his $14 million fortune following a series of bad investments and a bitter divorce settlement from his first wife. His second wife, Erin, the victim's daughter, detailed the toll the financial stress was taking on her husband. His personality has definitely changed. I miss my old husband. Following the arrest, the victim's other daughter, Adrian, saying in a statement, this was a heinous, calculated crime. My parents have been incredibly generous to Daniel Serafini and Aaron Spore throughout their marriage. Despite being pressed for my opinion, I cannot comment on my sister's level of involvement at this time. Our thanks to Janae Norman for that. Next tonight, Olympic gold medalist Mary Lou Retton is home from the hospital and in recovery mode, her daughter said on Monday, after a rare form of pneumonia left the former gymnast fighting for her life. Retton is 55. She spent nearly two weeks in an intensive care unit where she was unable to breathe on her own. A fundraising page set up by the family to help cover Retton's hospital bills was approaching $460,000 in donations. The family previously revealed Retton is uninsured. Our next guest is multi-platinum sensation Lil Tecca, who's taken the music world by storm with his unique blend of rap, R&B, and hip-hop. He has nearly 300 million streams and counting. He recently released his third chart-topping album, Tech. Let's take a listen to one of the singles, Need Me. She won't cast amigos till late night. The whole hood trying to slide so the list tight. She bad so she get by easy. She said she don't need you. She said that she need me. All right, Lil Tecca, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I see you bouncing your head to your own music, so I know that you really like it. Definitely. definitely. How do you feel with the new album coming out? I love it. I love that the fans love it. I worked so hard on it. Um, it took like two years to get this whole project done, so getting it out there, it feels like a whole weight off my shoulder oh, at sure. this point. Oh, yeah. sure, yeah. Two years of work. You're 21, right? Mm -hmm. 21, but two years of work in this. Two years. But your fourth album? Is that fourth, right? Yes. Fourth album. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, I would imagine it's overwhelming and also awesome, but how does it feel to have the success of the age you are? It feels great. Um, I've been working on this since I was like 13, yeah. so I'm like nine years, 10 years into this, and just seeing like people actually liking the stuff that I make, it's very good to see. You live in the dream? Definitely. Is it what you Definitely. thought it would be? When you, when you, have a dream in your head, you're kind of watching it. So when you're living the dream and you're like in that first person, kind of controlling everything, it's kind of it's kind of different, cause it it comes with a lot. Of course. And it's amazing, but at the same time, it's like okay, 
you got to make the right decision every time. You got to protect it. You got to protect it. So yeah, I, ho I hold it very close to my heart, and it's not something I take lightly at all. And also, still being all. that 13 year old from exactly. Queens, exactly. and then I think you lived on Long Island too. I believe I noticed. So we, we were talking before. You're, you still live in New York. You're from New York. I think that music video was yeah, that from was a grocery store in Queens, yeah, as in Ridgewood, that right? Was in New York, yeah. Clearly, you're proud. You're a proud New Yorker. For sure. Why? Just because it made me who I am. Besides my upbringing and everything else, being from New York, it gave me the culture. It gave me the the swag that I got. It gave me the the access to know about how to be fly, like <laughs> everything that I'm into, clothes. You know, like if I wasn't from New York, I wouldn't be who I am. Yeah. So I gotta. I gotta wave that flag, like, right. this is New York, for real. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm from Ohio, so I did not get access to how to be fly, <laughs> but I mean, you're doing it very well. Uh, I know you had a, a pop-up shop yesterday. Yeah, yeah. One of my coworkers, has a, his brother's 16, and he's a huge mm -hmm. fan of yours. He went to the pop-up shop, took, took a photo with you yesterday. So I, I called him up and was just like, tell me what you think about the music and how you feel mm -hmm. about it, and he was like, I, he's like, I love the vibe of it, but also he's like, I feel like I connect with him and I relate with him. What are you trying to convey with your music? basically my life. I feel like even if I'm talking about flexing or my emotions, music is a taste and that's what people resonate to the most. Yeah. Um, so when people that resonate to my music, they might resonate to either the things I'm saying or my beat selection or just the whole the way I put it together. Or it might not even be about my music. They might just like how I dress and be like, okay, he cool. But every part that I do, like that comes to tech dressing, all that things, it, it comes down to people relating to me. That's why I'm very intentional with what I do, mm -hmm. because I don't want to step out with anything that I'm not very proud of. So that's why when I speak my feelings, I speak it in the rawest form, and I speak it with a lot of vulnerability, mm -hmm. because there's nothing to hide. That was exactly what the uh, friend's coworker. Shout out to Brian. Uh, Shout big, out to Brian. Big little Tekka fan. Shout Absolutely, Brian, he's, he'll be sure. thrilled with that. I know that you said that this album, it was two years working on it, it's mm. a weight off your shoulders, so I'm not trying to get you going on to the next thing already, but I know you're already oh, flying nice. out after this. Yeah. What's coming up next for you? My next album is definitely in the works. What I can say is I'm going on a tour this November, East Coast tour, before my main tour, the world tour. I'm gonna mm -hmm. travel everywhere, Ohio too. Okay, good. And. Um, <laughs> Yeah, a lot of stuff going on. Right now I'm working on a project with my friend. Right now I'm working on music videos with my friends. I like creative directing. I like um, directing music videos, designing clothes. So okay. I'm working on a lot of stuff right now. I mean, I would imagine the opportunities are there for you. The man's name is Lil Tekka. You can listen to his new album, Tech, wherever you stream your music. Man, thanks so much for coming in. Great to meet you. Shout out my mom and my dad, too. Shout out to Mr. and Mrs. Tekka. Facts. <laughs> And that is our show for this hour. I'm Trevor Ault. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. And thank you for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, the major allegations against a coach of a university's elite gymnastics team by a star athlete says she's retiring at just 20 years old. And the latest from the front line to the war between Ukraine and Russia, what military officials in Ukraine say this new drone video shows. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health. Your money. Breaking news. Pop culture. With the biggest stars. Music trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Suicide turned into a homicide. Jordan came home and I said goodnight to him, and that's the last time I saw him. They threatened to send these photos to my family. We want money. You need to get it now. And it was constant. It could happen to anybody. And he said, Jordan's gone. And I said, no, no, no. It's nothing that no parents should have to go through. Sextortion. Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, OK, who's the target? And how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Trevor Alden for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with Hamas releasing two more hostages today from Gaza. This time, two elderly Israeli women who'd been abducted from their homes during the terror attack that took place now more than two weeks ago. The latest releases come as the IDF has escalated its strikes on Gaza in the past 24 hours. But Israel is now facing calls to delay a ground invasion to allow time for more negotiations that maybe could get more hostages released. There are also calls to get more humanitarian aid into Gaza to ease the crisis there. A handful of trucks coming in from Egypt today, but hundreds more are waiting to get through. Of course, we have team coverage tonight once again. We begin with ABC's Matt Gutman in Israel. This is the moment tonight in which two elderly Israeli hostages, Nurit Cooper, age 79, and Yochevet Lifshitz, 85, arrive at the border between Gaza and Egypt, finally free after more than two weeks in the hands of Hamas. Lifshitz seen here eased out of a Red Cross van, reaching back for that embrace and kiss of a Red Cross official. Both taken away in ambulances, receiving care at the Rafah border crossing with Egypt before arriving back in Israel. Hamas releasing this video showing armed militants turning the hostages over to the Red Cross, which facilitated their release. Qatar and Egypt also helping broker the deal. Yochevet and Nurit abducted from their homes along with their husbands during that merciless surprise attack on October 7th when Hamas terrorists stormed dozens of communities near the Gaza Strip, including their kibbutz near Oz. Over 1,400 Israelis were killed that day alone. A quarter of near Oz's population taken hostage. Cooper and Lifshitz's husbands, both in their 80s, still believed to be captives of Hamas. Late today, Lifshitz's grandson, Daniel, speaking to the Israeli press. The Broita. Saying they've communicated with my grandmother and that he hopes this opens the door for more hostages to be released. Daniel saying both his grandparents' phones last pinged from inside the Gaza Strip a week ago and they didn't know if they'd survived. Earlier today, Daniel saying his grandmother had dedicated her life to improving the plight of Palestinians in Gaza. They are uh, human rights activists, peace activists for all their life. For more than a decade, they took sick Palestinians from Gaza Strip to the hospitals in Israel to get treatment for their disease, for cancer, for anything. They couldn't get the right treatment in Gaza. The release of those hostages coming as Israel launched one of its deadliest barrages on Gaza yet, striking hundreds of targets and promising a multilateral operation in the air, ground and sea. 
Gaza officials saying over 400 Palestinians killed in the past 24 hours. <laughs> Palestinian journalist Muataz Azaza rescuing these two wounded toddlers, rushing them to a hospital. People gave me these two babies. They are injured by the bombing. I just hear them. You're fine. And today, more than 20 trucks carrying aid arriving into Gaza from Egypt, food and medicine, but no fuel. Israel fearing it could be used by Hamas. The aid meeting only about 1% of Gaza's daily needs. Tonight, more than 220 families still waiting for word on their loved ones held hostage, including Ohad Zakri. His family solemnly marking his ninth birthday today without him. Many holding balloons and signs calling for his release. Today, we spoke to the family of the first two hostages released by Hamas, Judith and Natalie Ranan, freed over the weekend. Ayelet Sela says the terrorists who kidnapped her cousins spoke English. Eight members of Ayelet's family still being held by Hamas, a family tree entirely broken, making that reunion even more intense. What was it like seeing them for the first time? All the emotions, all at once. I can say that I never felt... Uh a hug this intense in my life. I'm sure that's true. It's just unbelievable what these families are going through. And Matt Gutman joins me now from Israel. Matt, of course, such relief for those families today. But of course, there are so many more people still being held in Gaza. Are these hostage releases putting any more pressure on Israel to delay this ground invasion so that maybe more hostages can be freed alive? Trevor, it's images like this that we saw coming in late today. Those two senior Israeli hostages freed by Hamas, fragile, pale, but unharmed. And it's giving hope and expectations to additional family members that they could also see their loved ones released. And these images have been plastered wall to wall in Israel, putting increasing pressure on Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu, being echoed in Washington, by the way, to pause that invasion of the Gaza Strip and instead work on freeing those 200 and 20 hostages. Trevor. Just unfathomable what they've gone through. Matt Gutman, thank you. Meanwhile, the Biden administration remains in close contact with Israel as this crisis unfolds. So let's bring in ABC's chief White House correspondent, Mary Bruce. Mary, is President Biden putting any pressure on Israel to get more hostages out of Gaza before any possible ground invasion starts? Well, Trevor, the president has made clear that getting these hostages out is his top priority. Of course, today we saw those two Israelis released getting into that ambulance. This after that American mother and daughter were freed on Friday. And the president is still working to try and get more humanitarian aid into Gaza. We saw those additional trucks rolling in today. And while publicly the White House insists they are not going to dictate Israel's military response behind closed doors, we have learned that they are urging caution, pressing Israel to delay its ground invasion hoping to buy time to get more hostages out and more aid in. All of this comes as the administration is trying to contain this from becoming a wider war. We know they are keeping a close eye on Iran. Today saying that Iran is, quote, actively facilitating attacks to try and escalate this conflict, Trevor. That wider war, wider war is something so many people have said they're afraid of. Mary Bruce Force at the White House. Mary, thank you. Thank you. And turning now to the other major news today, the terrifying moments on board a passenger jet when an off-duty pilot allegedly tried to shut down the engines mid-flight with 83 people on board. Authorities say the on-duty cockpit and cabin crew subdued that man. They handcuffed him to a seat in the back of the cabin. ABC's transportation correspondent Gio Benitez has the details. Tonight, the FBI is investigating after an off-duty pilot allegedly tried to crash a passenger plane. Alaska Airlines Flight 2059 left Everett, Washington, bound for San Francisco at 5.23 p.m. Sunday, packed full with 80 passengers, including multiple infants on laps. And 44-year-old Joseph Emerson, an off-duty pilot with Alaska Airlines who was hitching a ride, seated in a jump seat inside the cockpit. Soon after takeoff, he allegedly tried to cut the plane's engines by pulling the fire extinguisher handles on the engines called a T-handle. The T-handle, which is what this individual tried to pull on each engine, actually turns the engine off and prepares it for a fire extinguisher. The problem is, at high altitude, you can get the engines restarted. At low altitude, there could be a fatal result. The crew able to overpower Emerson and get him out of that cockpit. 
handcuffing him to a seat in the rear of the cabin. We've got the uh, guy that tried to shut the engines down uh, out of the cockpit. Doesn't sound like he's causing any issue in the back right now. I, I think he's the dude. I was panicked. I was alone in the back, um, and, you know, everyone was shifting around. Um, trying to figure out what was happening. The pilots diverting to Portland, where Emerson was taken into custody. After we did land and the gentleman was escorted off, the flight attendant got back on the speaker and said, plain and simple, he had a mental breakdown. Tonight, the airline and the FAA say the incident is not related to current events. And Gio Benitez joins us now. Okay, Gio, so we hear in your reporting not related to current events, but is there any idea of what the motive could have been? Well, Trevor, as you can imagine, right now, the FBI, all of the investigators, they are scouring his social media because they want to know everything about his past to see what that motive could have been. Uh, meanwhile, he will be in court tomorrow. And again, he's facing 83 counts of attempted murder. It's an incredible amount of charges that he's facing now. Trevor. Staggering and so frightening. Gio Benitez, thank you. Next tonight, Detroit police providing an update surrounding their ongoing investigation of a synagogue president who was fatally stabbed. 40-year-old Samantha Wool was found at her home after police were alerted of an unresponsive person on the ground. They followed a trail of blood to Wool's home. Police worked closely with the FBI to analyze forensic evidence and to conduct interviews. They say so far they have found no evidence of anti-Semitism as a motive. Also tonight, there is an urgent manhunt after a Maryland judge was shot multiple times in his own driveway, dying at the hospital. Police have announced a new clue, though, the discovery of the suspect's vehicle. Here's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas. Tonight, five days after authorities say a Maryland judge was shot in a targeted attack in his own driveway, the urgent manhunt for Pedro Argote underway. Their primary clue, his 2009 Mercedes SUV like this one, found over the weekend eight miles from the scene of the murder. According to authorities, Judge Andrew Wilkinson was shot multiple times outside of his home while his wife and children were inside. We think uh, Judge Wilkinson was targeted. Uh, he ruled in a court case early in the day against Mr. Agate, and we feel that was the, that was the reason for the murder. Just hours before he was killed, Wilkinson granting Argote's divorce, ruling that he could have no contact with his wife or his children unless initiated by her. And tonight, new details about Argote's marriage. The couple apparently got into heated arguments, and at one point his wife sought and later dropped a restraining order. The Washington County Sheriff's Office did respond to the home a couple times for uh, verbal domestics in the last uh, few years, but no uh, physical violence that we know of. And Pierre Thomas joins us now. So, Pierre, have police released any details on where the suspect may be? Well, they believe he may have left the immediate area, but they are urging the public to stay on alert, Trevor, because he's considered armed and dangerous. Absolutely. Pierre Thomas, thank you. Now to the major allegations involving the University of Utah's gymnastics program. A star gymnast has announced her retirement, alleging she was subjected to verbal and emotional abuse from a team coach. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has her story. Explosive allegations. An elite gymnast unexpectedly announcing she's leaving the sport after abuse at one of the country's top university programs. Create the momentum, lifting high into the double straight, and that was a super dismount. Kara Aker, a two-time gold medalist at the World Championships, announcing her retirement, claiming on Instagram she was the victim of verbal and emotional abuse from an overpowering coach while part of the University of Utah's gymnastics team. The 20-year-old seen here landing a perfect 10 at the Pac-12 in January did not name a coach in her post. Beautiful Stuck landing. But Tom Farden has been the program's sole head coach since 2020. The university recently investigating Farden, a report last month finding, while he more likely than not threw a stopwatch and a cellular telephone in frustration in the presence of student athletes, he did not engage in any acts of physical abuse, emotional abuse, or harassment as defined by Safe Sport Code. Farden responding to that investigation saying in part, it has been painful to learn of the negative impacts that my words and actions have created. I am fully committed to improving our student athlete experience. If we've learned anything is that we should be listening to every single athlete. When someone like Kara speaks as she has, 
and has the courage and the confidence and the fortitude to come forward in this manner and bear her soul and say that she's retiring from the sport she loves because it is so broken. ABC News reached out to the university. It has not commented on the allegations. I was really interested in coming to Utah because of their team chemistry and how they worked with one another. Aker now encouraging others to speak out and stand up for what you believe is right. This is truly another watershed moment in gymnastics. And it seems to me that University of Utah with that investigation has not met the moment. That is Eva Pilgrim reporting our thanks to Eva. Also today, some thick fog and zero visibility caused a deadly and massive pileup on I-55 in Louisiana, just outside New Orleans. It involved dozens of cars and trucks, vehicles slamming into each other. Look at the pictures here. At least one vehicle went over the guardrail. Some of them even caught fire. Our Victor Okendo has the latest on the dead, the injured, and those left stranded. Tonight, a deadly mix of fog and smoke from nearby marsh fires, blinding drivers, and triggering multiple pileups west of New Orleans. Dozens of burned out cars and trucks choking I-55, leaving more than 100 drivers stranded on the highway. Several of those crashes today, sparking fires on the highway, flames and smoke seen in the distance. Well, I'm trying to tell you. Whoa, somebody, hey boy, check on your people. Firefighters using ladders to reach some of the fiery wreckage. The phenomenon known as super fog, a mix of fog and smoke, is especially dangerous on highways where visibility can suddenly drop to just a few feet within minutes. This was the view from behind the wheel this morning as a thick shroud of fog moved in, blanketing New Orleans. The skyline completely disappeared. And tonight, Louisiana's governor is urging residents to donate blood to help the wounded. There's a chance of more super fog in the coming days. Trevor. Victor Okendo Forrest. Victor, thank you. CVS is removing one type of common decongestant from their shelves after an FDA advisory committee said it was ineffective. The products contain the oral formulation of phenylephrine, or PE, which is found in several over-the-counter medications. After nearly a century of over-the-counter use, though, the FDA Non-Prescription Drugs Advisory Committee unanimously voted in September that PE did not improve nasal congestion any more than a placebo at the given dose. Dosage. CVS did not give specifics on which brands will be removed. We still have much more to get to here tonight. Coming up, traveling the seas, voyaging around the world at just seven years old, but it wasn't all an adventure. Author Suzanne Haywood details her unconventional childhood and the dangers of living at the mercy of the waters. But next, a warning about the ice melt in Antarctica, what scientists are saying about the possibility of turning things around. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news.
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. I'm Whit Johnson, reporting from Maui. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. We're tracking several headlines around the world, including the ongoing brutal war in Ukraine. The Ukrainian military released this drone footage that they say shows Russia advancing on the frontline town of Avdivka. This as the Kremlin reacts to President Biden's ongoing support for Ukraine. The Russian spokesman rejected Biden's pledge of leadership in the ongoing war there, telling reporters today Russia is building a new world order and one that doesn't revolve around the United States. In Argentina, presidential hopeful Sergio Massa won the first round of votes ahead of Javier Millet, a far-right libertarian economist. Massa is the country's current economy minister. He won nearly 37% of the vote in Argentina's general election on Sunday. To win the November runoff, he'll have to convince voters that he can save the nation from economic turmoil that his government did help create. In West Antarctica, it may be too late to prevent significant melting. According to new models published Monday in Nature Climate Change, sea ice reached a record low in February. One Antarctic researcher summarized it with, we are now committed to a rapid increase in ocean warming and ice melting for the rest of the century. Our next guest says her childhood was turned upside down one fateful day when her dad said, we're going to follow Captain Cook. Now, in her new book, Wave Walker, a memoir of breaking free, Suzanne Haywood chronicles her voyage around the world at just seven years old, traveling through storms and shipwrecks, getting very little formal schooling, and of course, all of the crashing tides with family relationships as you're dealing with that. Suzanne, thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much. Delighted it, to be here. It's a pleasure to meet you. I think we have everyone's attention just with that introduction, <laughs> but if you could... This is a wild story and you got a whole book's worth of tales, but if you could just give people a little background of what your childhood was like out on sailing the world. Yeah, so basically we set sail when I was seven years old and I ended up being at sea for 10 years for a decade. My father originally said we were gonna go sailing for three years, but he just kept sailing, which meant of course I couldn't go to school, I couldn't have friends, we were on this boat. And the story really is a very intense story because it ends up being all about the family relationships that evolve on this boat as the years go by. Right, which of course speaks to how extraordinary it is that the sailing around the world for 10 years is secondary to the tale. Uh, it's one thing to have a life that is extraordinary, and you certainly have one, but what made you think this is a book that, it, this is a story that I want to tell to people? Well, it is an extraordinary adventure story. Mm -hmm. We get shipwrecked in the Indian Ocean. We get hit by an enormous wave. I end up having head operations on a tiny atoll in the middle of nowhere. We go to some extraordinary places. And then it's a story of escape because I have to teach myself. I basically have to self-educate myself to get out of there, to get to university. So it's also a tale about the power of education. And I've gone on from there to, you know, create a much more normal life for myself. But I came from a boatyard. I, and I believe that surgery that you mentioned, that had to happen without anesthesia, is that correct? That's right, in the middle of the Indian Ocean because we ended up shipwrecked on a tiny atoll in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I mean, I'm sure that this was a gradual process, but over the course of 10 years, you're a child, you're figuring things out about the world in your own right, but how was that gradual process of learning, this is something that I need to break away from? It came over time, you see, because when we set sail and I was only seven years old, I thought this was a magical adventure story. You know, we met whales, we saw phosphorescence, we saw dolphins. But as time went on, I began to realize that this thing that looked like an amazing voyage was increasingly like a prison. I was trapped on board this boat with my father, my mother, my brother, and I couldn't get away. I couldn't spend time with friends. I couldn't do any of the normal things that you would expect to do. And that's when I decided I had to break away. Mm -hmm. You mentioned this right off the top, but beyond just being about, you know, sailing and shipwrecks, and those are all enthralling tales, but it is about your family relationships. How do you view your parents as people now? So I think my father is an amazing adventurer. Um, but I think if you're going to be an adventurer of that sort, you've got to take account of your family. You know, to take a child with you 
for, you know, a few months would be absolutely fine. But to take your children with you for a decade, I think, is very tough. And I'm a mum now myself. I've got three kids. Yeah. I would never take my kids away for 10 years. I, and, they, frankly, they never want to go sailing, so I don't think I'm going to get the chance. <laughs> right, let alone for, <laughs> for 10 years or That's right. 10 hours. I mean, the, the term breaking free right there in the title, there's, a, there's the obvious literal definition of breaking free of your family, but I would imagine it has a much larger context. So what does breaking free really mean to you? For me, breaking free was breaking out of a dream. My father had a dream which was a sail around the world. Uh, and that dream started off as a three-year dream. It ended up being a decade-long dream. And for me, breaking free was coming out of somebody else's dream and creating a life for myself. What do you want people to take away from your story? Well, I hope they really enjoy the book. I mm -hmm. really, really hope they enjoy the book. Uh, but I also want them to take from that the power of education. And I hope adventurers, any adventurers that read it, think about the children that they involve. Right, the, the, the people that are along for the ride. Yes, you yes. don't get a choice to go with them. Yes, and it's, uh, it's useful even if you're not sailing the world. Suzanne, thank you so much for being here. Wave Walker, a memoir of Breaking Free, can be found wherever books are sold. Suzanne? Wonderful to meet you. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. And still to come, what do you do when you want to take a class, but there's no teacher? We're going to tell you how a high school band is taking matters into their own hands. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Finally tonight, the high school band in West Virginia, which found itself without a music teacher, but is still going strong thanks to the students who banded together to come up with a solution. ABC's Will Reeve has their story. They may be few, but they're mighty at Pocahontas High. Let's go, Warriors! Ready, go. After their former band teacher took a job at another school and with no candidates in sight, Principal Joe Riley gave the option, take another class or rock on. Let's go, Warriors! He came in here and he was like, you don't have to quit. <laughs> and we were like, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> We realized that we'd have to band together as, you know, just a bunch of kids and figure it out. One, two, ready, go. After electing a student leader and with the help of two math teachers stepping up as advisors, the bandmates got to work. We kind of have a duty system. And for the, the uh, sections that only have one player per instrument. Which is most um, of them. Yeah, which is most of them. We all kind of rely on each other uh, to get the right music. I was incredibly involved in arts and arts education when I was in high school. And I can't imagine being like, no, I'm going to put my clarinet aside and I'm going to learn a different instrument just because like, that's what the band needs. And to see them stepping up into big leadership roles and putting themselves in the spotlight is huge for them. <laughs> The band cheering the Warriors on during their last home football game last Friday, bringing the school spirit ready to pack a punch one beat at a time. I love that. That's Will Reeve reporting, and that is our show for tonight. I'm Trevor Alt. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. And you can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com.